Hello and thanks for tuning into the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories near and far. I'm Chamberlain Osawa Channel's television here in Lagos. I'm joined by Vincent Makori from Voice of America in Washington. Thanks. I'm Vincent Makori at the Voice of America in Washington. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Now, due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, our broadcast looks a little different for now. We appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Chamberlain Oso in Lagos brings you that story. Nigeria has taken delivery of 3,924,000 doses of Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccines. The vaccines arrived at the Inamdi Azikiwe International Airport, Abuja, and was received by top government officials, led by the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Mr. Boss Mustafa. Nigeria received its first COVID-19 vaccines on Tuesday, March the 2nd, to kick off an inoculation program in Africa's most populous nation, delivered under the International COVAX scheme. Nigeria is the third West African country to receive COVAX shots after Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, which had both started vaccination campaigns. I would also like to say that as a gesture of goodwill, in addition to the supplies through COVAX, India will also be donating 100,000 doses of vaccines uh, for Nigeria, for which we got the approval yesterday, and it will be coming shortly as well. Boss Mustafa, chairman of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19, assures some skeptical Nigerians that the vaccines are safe. They are very effective and efficacious, and that I would urge at the time of vaccination and deployment, if you fall into the category that will be vaccinated, make yourself available. It will do you no harm. Nobody is intending to kill anybody. This is for the good and well-being of Nigeria. The government expects to receive 84 million doses of Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine from COVAX this year, enough to inoculate 20 percent of the population. We are also expecting uh, vaccines uh, from the African Union through uh, the AVAT uh, uh, platform. We're expecting some 41 million doses uh, of, uh, of vaccines from the uh, African Union, made up of up to 22.9 million doses uh, of AstraZeneca and about 18.4 million doses of uh, the Johnson & Johnson. COVAX, led by Vaccine Alliance Gavi and the World Health Organization, with UNICEF as an implementing partner, aims to deliver nearly 2 billion doses around the world by the end of 2021. Let's get more on this story from a molecular virologist, Dr. Solomon Cholom. Thank you for joining us on Africa 54. Now, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has been hailed as the vaccine of the world because it's cheaper and easier to stop. But there's also been questions over its efficiency against COVID-19 variants. Take, for example, what happened in South Africa. So how optimistic are you about this particular vaccine rollout here in Nigeria? You understand that the first choice in terms of the vaccine for Nigeria was um, the Pfizer vaccine. And um, that because of the fact that um, our cooling uh, facilities here um, do not meet that you know, requirement, so we had to resort to you know, the second alternative, which is AstraZeneca, because it's fairly thermostable. Um, yeah, with regards to the South African variant, um, we understand that uh, the, the performance of that vaccine is you know, um, and not up to speed as it were. But um, we are optimistic that since the South African variant for now has not been I, I, identified in Nigeria, um, uh, for the time being, the AstraZeneca vaccine, you know, can suffice, especially for the fact that it was produced, you know, in Oxford, and, and, and of course the variants over there in the UK is what, you know, has been fingered to be circulating here in Nigeria. So um, there is that similarity between what we have here in Nigeria and, and what they have there of, you know, in UK. 
with regards to the variants. And um, we are hoping that um, for the time being, this vaccine will you know, provide the needed you know, pro now, in terms of handling and preserving this vaccine before it gets distributed to remote areas? First and foremost, we need to do you know, an, an in-country assessment as it were of this vaccine. It is in tandem with you know, the regulatory you know, uh, uh, rule of uh, NAFDAQ and, and, and a system bodies. So we expect that issues with regards to the physical, you know, comportment as well of this vaccine should be assessed. Um, we may not have the latitude to you know, do in-depth, you know, validation as it were, but you know, preliminary should should be done to confirm that what what we have received is in order. But then we need to also put our logistics and ensure that you know the do not jeopardize the um, overall activity of this vaccine when uh, so um, uh, given that the vaccine is you know stable at you know temperature there are the uh, temperatures of two to eight degrees um, that is basically what your normal you know, um, uh, your normal refrigerator in the house can uh, bring but then Government must, you know, identify, you know, places from uh, the national to the uh, states to, you know, regions within the state, and then various local government to provide alternative power for the storage of this vaccine at the appropriate conditions to ensure that at the end of it all, we do not, you know, just have a vaccine that has lost out the potency because of our failure to contain the cold chain. Well, you know, the vaccine has been rolled out here with the number of people receiving theirs, but there's been a lot of misinformation about vaccines. What would you say to anyone who still a bit wary about receiving a jab? Yeah, so, um, we encourage people that uh, we should look out issues with regards to quality, you know, look out issues with regards to religion and culture and you know take up issues that that are science based now for us the expert as far as we are concerned this vaccine based on what has been rolled out by the producers and i don't think you know they will take that step to deceive the whole world they have shown us the protocols they have shown us the you know, um, steps you know, through which this this vaccine was produced, and you know the um, trials, clinical trials, and then the data. So um, uh, we are holding them based on the veracity of this, and and uh, based based on this, we are saying that this vaccine should should be given a chance. That you know, with regards to the safety, it is not what anybody should have in doubt. Of course, we are not the first country to roll it out. And you know, countries even within Africa have you no know, role like Ghana. And we have not had any serious adverse reaction. So as it were now, let's believe that what, what we have brought on board is something that you know is going to meet the um, basic, you know, um, basic minimum standard in regards to what a quality vaccine brings All right, on board. Then. All right, Dr. Solomon Cholum, thank you for joining us today on Africa 54. Thank you. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Scores of privately owned schools in Kenya closed during COVID-19 pandemic, but some of the school buildings have been repurposed as businesses such as providing residential housing and even one selling coffins. Brenda Molina reports from Nairobi. John Kamande sells coffin for a living out of a showroom that, until last year, was full of young life. This building was a privately run Nairobi kindergarten until last July, when the COVID-19 pandemic forced it to close. Corona pandemic is the one that made me to get this shop. Because the school was closed, there were no kids. 
nearly 400 private schools were forced to close because of the pandemic, according to Kenya's Private School Association, affecting 56,000 students as the buildings were repurposed. Children at this former primary school are living with their families in what were classrooms after it was turned into rental housing. Nase Kirui taught math and science before the school closed but stayed on as a property manager. I used to be a teacher here, but uh, because of uh, money, I lack money, and that's why I asked for the caretaker. The impact of Kenya's private school closures is likely to be felt for some time. We have a very big supply gap in our country, and our population is growing last census at about one million a year. So we have a lot of work to do. Kenya's government in September pledged about $64 million in support for private schools, but is yet to make good on the promise. Brenda Molina for VOA News, Nairobi. As the world marks International Women's Day, let's take a look at some iconic Nigerian, Nigerian women who are making the country and indeed the continent of Africa proud. Celebrated annually on March the 8th, International Women's Day is a global day celebrating the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women. The day also marks a call to action for accelerating gender parity. The campaign theme for International Women's Day 2021 is Choose to Challenge, with people being called on to choose to challenge and call out gender bias and inequality. According to UNICEF, Nigeria's maternal mortality rate remains high and more girls than boys are out of school, exposing them to different forms of abuse. However, it's not all doom and gloom for Nigeria, as a number of trailblazing women are making the country proud. An example is Nigeria's richest woman, Forlorn Shalakija. What a man can do, a woman can do. And I don't see any reason why a woman shouldn't be able to do it. You can prove your point, you understand me, by letting them know that, listen, I've done this, I can do the next one. Another trailblazer is the Director General of the World Trade Organization, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwiala, who resumed office on March the 1st. Today, WTO members are making history. For the first time in the 73 years of GATT and WTO, you are selecting a woman and an African as Director General. This is groundbreaking and positive. UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed is another woman making Nigeria and Africa proud. When people see me in the United Nations, I remind them that I started my school in Meduguri. So you can become anything that you wish to be. You just have to work hard and you have to believe and you have to do the right thing. And you have to have faith. Whichever faith you have, you have to have faith. Beautiful, intelligent, high flyers like former Vice President of the World Bank, Dr. Obieze Kwesili and Aruma Ote also make the list. And corporate Amazon, Ibukwa Woshika, cannot be left out. Whether in the corporate world, in politics, on the home front, Nigerian women are making a mark because they dare to challenge stereotypes and rise above real and emergent limitations. So the question for all women, and men as well, on International Women's Day is, Will you choose to challenge? Doing so brings us a step closer to reaching the fifth sustainable development goal of achieving gender equality and empowerment of all women and girls by the year 2030. Temi Tokwe Fagbimi, reporting for Channels Television News. African entrepreneurs are creating innovations that help farmers improve their yields. In Ghana, Sesi Technologies, the company behind GrainMate, allows farmers and grain purchasers to affordably measure moisture levels of maize, rice, wheat, millet, sorghum, and other staples. Africa 54 technology correspondent Paul Dio spoke to Isaac Sesi, the CEO of Sesi Technologies. Isaac Sisi, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you very much, Paul. You built uh, an incredible uh, technology that has helped a lot of farmers across uh, Ghana and uh, across Africa uh, to figure out how to manage uh, their yields, uh, to manage their crops. Uh, let's start there. 
Yes, we built a technology to help reduce post-harvest losses in grains among farmers. And this technology is called Grain Mate, Grain Moisture Meter, which is a simple moisture meter that makes it possible for anyone that works with grains to measure the moisture content in their grains before storage so they can um, reduce losses. You know, just being able to know the moisture content in your grains can be the difference between your grains growing moldy and you losing all of your harvest and you being able to store for long and reap the benefits of storing for long. Why agriculture? There are so many other places that you could have gone, but uh, you chose to go into agriculture. Both my parents are farmers. You know, I have been close to the food value chain. I've been really excited about being able to grow things in the soil and see it come up. And I have also been in the, in the space of seeing farmers work so hard and just something small takes away all of their produce and then the hardship that results from, from, uh, from that, that happening. And so I realized that one of the ways I could Im apply my knowledge and my skills in technology in a way that was fundamental to uh, human beings is in the field of agriculture because every one of us eats and uh, half of the continent is employed in agriculture, which means that if you are solving problems in agriculture, you can reach so many people and you can impact lives at a very fundamental level. Have you been able to scale beyond uh, Ghana? Already we have partners that we're working with in, in Kenya, in Zimbabwe, in Rwanda, and in Nigeria that are, are, that are going to be our partners to scale this technology in these countries already. We have units that are in use in Zimbabwe, in Kenya, and in Rwanda. When I've talked to a lot of uh, our farmers, uh, either small-scale farmers or commercial farmers, uh, how has uh, your technology helped them improve their products or get better yields at the end of a harvest season? It's true that smallholder farmers actually face a lot of challenges. In fact, it was something that we learned while working with the World Food Program for over a period of one year. So we came back and then we said, what can we do to solve more problems? Because we realized that we could only make the maximum impact if we're providing a holistic solution. And then we developed a suite of post-service management technologies that uh, really helps them right from the drying, threshing, um, storage, even to the point of marketing. And we, we've put all this together in a package called Pharma Pack, um, which we are delivering to the farmers. So we have been able to sort of solve a lot of their problems. And the exciting thing is that we're presenting this solution in a way that they can pay for us. Are you looking for potential investors from maybe... Uh, people who are looking at your product and they're saying we want to be part of this. So we're looking for investors. We're looking to raise half a million dollars to scale our production, to scale our product development and um, our marketing and distribution. Where We've been actively reaching out to investors and our doors are also open for anybody who believes that we can partner to create value for everybody involved. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for your time. Thank you so much, Paul. A creative 68-year-old man is using Egypt streets as an open-air gym, according to this senior citizen. His solution to staying fit without monthly fees and kits is to use poles and street benches and pavements of Egypt's outdoors to stay healthy. For Abdel Shahata, a 68-year-old Egyptian fitness lover, age is just a number and location is everywhere and anywhere. Early in the mornings, when most residents of the southern Egyptian city of Minyar sleep, Ali can be found bending and stretching on the city's light poles, climbing trees and working out on the city's cronish along the banks of the Nile. He says he has been doing his routine street workouts for five years. Ali, a retired agriculture engineer, is often met with sarcasm, especially from younger people. They might say that I am an immature old man. Let them say what they want. I feel like I am 25 years old, not more than that. This is by the grace of God. 
Some of Ali's family members also think he needs to stop, fearing that he might be injured, while other family members encourage him. There are people who say, you have to quit. You're growing old. Age has its limits. You may have a fracture while doing one of your moves. You're not young. This is the way they think. I never think about this. If I think about it, I will go to sleep. Ali believes that the street workout is an easy option for those who cannot afford to go to the gym. For him, playing in the open air is essential and he wishes many people, younger or older, would do the same. Somalia is home to the world's largest camel population and camel milk plays an important role in Somali food. The camel milk industry is trying to expand beyond the domestic market but faces some challenges as Mohamed Sheikh Noor reports from Mogadishu. Somalia is the world is the biggest producer of camel milk. Badr Camel Farm on the outskirts of Mogadishu produces 36,000 liters of camel milk per month. Veterinarian Abdul Saq Mira says camel milk is healthy and not just for camels. Camel milk is a nutritious resource that God gave to humans. Camel milk is rich in multiple vitamins and protein, calcium, iron, and potassium. It is a complete food. Known in Africa as white gold for its nutritional value, Camel milk is a regular part of Somali diet. I am a regular customer here and always buy a packet of milk each day. It is the favorite drink for my aging grandmother and blind uncle. Drinking camel milk keeps us all healthy. Jama Umar owns a few camel farms but says all of the milk produced is for the domestic market. There is no doubt about our ambition to export camel milk to other parts of the world, especially to the West. But the question is, is this an easy task? I would say no, because Somalia and other Africans face difficulties as what they produce is never appreciated. Camel milk's reputation as a superfood has spread from herders to African cities and is slowly gaining international attention. Getting the milk certified safe for foreign markets is part of the challenge. Somalia's livestock ministry says it is working on a law to boost camel milk exports. Currently, our country has no formal structures for exporting camel milk, and what goes out of the country is few and far between. Local demand remains high. Nonetheless, we are developing a national policy, and after it is discussed in parliament, endorsed by the cabinet, and the president agrees, then Somalia will have a milk law that enables us to export camel milk. The ministry plan is to also build cold storage collection centers to ensure the milk is well preserved for reaching new markets. Mohamed Shagnur for VOA News, Mogadishu, Somalia. Well, and that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and the world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. And visit Macor in Washington. Channel's television has our last word from Lagos. We look forward to bringing you another show next week. Remember, ChannelsTV.com is your source for news and other programming. I'm Chamberlain, so thank you for watching. Goodbye.